Thanks very much, and I'm, I'm coming with this because my little brain is too small to remember numbers, and I've got numbers for this talk. But I labeled the talk specifically that way because uh, I knew Dr. Mosafarian was coming. And, uh, and I thought it would be an interesting thing. So thanks for Khan for inviting me. And basically, today's talk is going to be a tale of four studies. And the first thing I'll say, though, is that I have no relevant financial disclosure uh, to provide, uh, unfortunately. And uh, in terms of uh, studies, I'm just going to get right into it because I know we don't have a lot of time. And I want to start off talking about this study. Uh, this study was published, la I think it was last year, uh, about white rice consumption and the risk of type 2 diabetes. And it was published in the British Medical Journal. It was a meta-analysis and a systemic review, which certainly sounds like a very rigorous and uh, thorough and robust type of study. Now, when you read the study, what you discover fairly quickly is that there weren't a lot of studies for them to choose from after their exclusion criteria were applied. So by the end of their exclusionary criteria, they were left with four studies detailing seven cohorts, two of which had exceedingly low rates of type 2 diabetes, which is what this study is supposed to be looking for. Uh, two of those seven cohorts did not control for differences in dietary composition patterns. So all the other various things that may be applicable to the development of type 2 diabetes relatable to diet were not controlled. One didn't control for family history of diabetes. Six of the seven didn't control for income and socioeconomic status. None controlled for the consumption of other refined grains and sugars. And so that those sorts of misses do happen in research. It's always easy to point at a study and say this is a problem. Um, when they actually looked at the numbers in the study itself, the, their pooled relative risk for the highest consumption of white rice was 1.27. Uh, for the, the, Their confidence interval had a lot of heterogeneity, and it started at 1.04. But when they took Asians out of their mix, um, that confidence interval uh, started now at 0.94. And so it wasn't the most robust of studies. And in fact, the BMJ, to their credit, put out an editorial along with it, which I found interesting because here they've published a study talking about risk of type 2 diabetes and white rice consumption. And here they're writing an editorial that says, well, um, it's interesting, but they don't have immediate implications for doctors, patients, public health services, can't support large-scale action. We need to do further research to develop and substantiate this piece of information. And here's where it gets really interesting. This is their press release. Their press release from the BMJ is white rice increases the risk of type 2 diabetes. And in fact, I think you've got to read seven, the first seven paragraphs are supportive of the thesis that this is a causal problem. The last paragraph makes reference to that um, editorial that was co-published. And as a consequence, perhaps, of the fact that reporters need to report, and not all of them necessarily take a huge amount of time, and go figure, here's a press release from the BMJ where the headline is white rice increases the risk of type 2 diabetes. This is, of course, what happened. Uh, this was the Daily Express in, in England, and then everywhere else had their own versions of these very alarmist press releases that says eating white rice um, daily ups diabetes risk. And maybe it does. I'm just not certain that this particular meta-analysis makes that case very strongly. Um, I'm going to move on to the next study, and study is a strong word because this was a letter that was published in the Archives of Internal Medicine uh, also, I believe, last year about the association between chocolate consumption and body mass index. Anybody here remember hearing in the news that eating chocolate makes you thinner? Does it, did that reach your radar? Um, and so this was uh, 975 men and women who had completed a single food frequency questionnaire. And they completed the questionnaire as part of a study not designed to look at chocolate and weight, but was designed to look at the impact of statin drugs on cardiac uh, disease uh, endpoints. And included in the food frequency questionnaire, that one questionnaire that they took, these 975 folks, was the question, how many times a week do you consume chocolate? Not how much chocolate do you consume, but how many times a week do you consume chocolate? And then the author, um, Dr. Gallome, controlled for uh, the relationship of chocolate frequency, body mass index, and then dietary variables that she considered as well were fruit and vegetable intake and saturated fat intake and nothing else. There were no other dietary controls listed in this particular um, 
uh, letter to the editor. And as far as non-dietary variables that may have a bearing on obesity, she included mood and the number of times a week you were active for 20 minutes. Not coexisting medical conditions, not medications, not socioeconomic status, not education, not sleep, not marital status, not smoking. I mean, there's a lot of variables. We all know that in this room. There are a lot of variables that affect weight. They were not considered in this particular study. Less than 24 hours after publication of this study, there were 443 news reports about how chocolate may help keep people slim. And clearly, not just in you know, the tabloid-style news reports. This was truly everywhere. And as far as why they were everywhere, this was the press release put out by her institution, UC San Diego. Regular chocolate eaters are thinner. And included in this press release was this quote from the researcher, our findings appear to add to a body of information suggesting that the composition of calories, not just the number of them, matters for determining their ultimate impact on weight, which I agree with, and I think Dr. Moe's friends will be talking about. In the case of chocolate, this is good news, both for those who have a regular chocolate habit and those who may wish to start one. <laughs> and, you know, I think that there needs to be some degree of oversight in what we as researchers and what institutions are putting out for the press because go figure that the press ran with this story suggesting that we should develop a chocolate habit because of a study that definitely did not have the power to make the conclusion that chocolate made people slimmer. And so the next study I'm going to talk about was also from the BMJ. Uh, this was a study that looked at low-carb diets, supposedly. And uh, this study had 43,396 Swedish women who were given a single food frequency questionnaire that asked them to highlight in detail the number of times they ate 80 different food items over the course of the prior six months. Now. I don't know if anybody here can remember how many times they ate things over the course of the past prior six months. I know I cannot do that, and I keep a food diary. Um, so I think the likelihood of this actually providing any robust information is low, but more troublesome for me was that they then took this one time point and extrapolated that diet as being what these people ate for the next 15 years. Now, 15 years ago, I know I was eating very differently than I am currently eating. I don't think it is abnormal for diets to change and evolve, in part because of what the media is telling us we should and shouldn't eat, and in part because society does change. And so this was an odd place to start for this study, but let's assume that that is a robust way to do things. Looking at their calorie reporting, and I'm going to be coming back to this in the next uh, study I'm talking about as well. This study reported an average daily calorie consumption for these women of 1,561 calories. And that's actually a very low number. This is for all the women in this study. This is not just for the low-carb women. This is for people in all the, the different centiles of carbs that they looked at, where the United Nations, their food and agriculture organization, at the same time point, was reporting that the average per capita consumption of calories in Sweden was 2,990 calories for women. And that is a very big discrepancy and makes me wonder about the robustness of that single food frequency questionnaire asking about six months worth of eating and 80 different items. But let's again assume that that was just fine and dandy. Going forward, if you're doing a study on low carb or anything impacting on cardiovascular disease risk, I would have thought it would be important to also eliminate those items that we know pretty clearly contribute to the development of cardiovascular disease, like trans fat, for instance, or just having qualities of carbohydrates, qualities of proteins, qualities of fats, not just simply are you eating fats, are you eating proteins, but that was what they looked at. They were comparing you know, sausage consumption versus salmon consumption, quinoa versus white rice, kale versus potatoes, because they weren't actually looking at the actual quality of the foods that were being consumed. 
And so the only consideration they gave to quality was one thing where they were looking at whether or not proteins were animal-based sourced or vegetable-based sourced. In any case, the finding of this study was a 5% relative risk increase in low carb at the lowest carb consumption, which translated to four to five additional cases of heart disease in 10,000 women per year. Which, given the struggles that the methodology might have had, is again a very strong statement, I would think. But it frustrates me a little bit more because it actually wasn't a study on low-carb diets. These were not low-carb diets. So looking at the data, the first quartile of carb consumption is a diet where 40% of calories were coming from carbohydrates. You can ask Dr. Wartman, who I see in the audience, a diet with 40% of carbohydrates is not a low-carb diet. Looking at their lowest centile, they divided it into 10 centiles, actually, even that wasn't a low-carb diet, where that was 32% of calories coming from carbohydrates. So here we've got a study claiming that low-carb diets are bad for you, and I'm not an advocate or an opponent to low-carb diets. I'm just saying that this wasn't actually a low-carb diet. And so the editorial, or not the editorial, the, the press release from the BMJ group at the same time was, experts warn of significant cardiovascular risks with Atkins-style diets. And if you read the actual published editorial in the BMJ, this is now not a press release, this is in the published editorial. They wrote, despite the popularity of these diets, clinicians should probably advise against their use for long-term control of body weight. That is a very strong statement for a study that does not look at low-carb diets. Um, and of course, there were a lot of press releases, or a lot of press stories, talking about this. Atkins-like diets may increase the risk of heart disease on ABC News. This was everywhere as well, you know, that if you go on Atkins, you're going to harm yourself. And maybe you will, maybe you won't. I don't know. This data, data certainly doesn't suggest one thing or another. And this is Journal Watch, you know, from the New England Journal. And if you read their little summary of this particular study, again, nobody questioned anything, which was weird and surprising to me, but maybe it was consequent to the strength of the editorial that was written in the BMJ. The last study is from Harvard, from Dr. Mosafarian's uh, university, and it was a great study, I thought. It was on red meat consumption and mortality, and I'm not going to list all of the different controls because it'll take all the time that I've got to go through all of the variables that were so thoughtfully controlled in this study. I mean, it is very difficult to do these sorts of studies. There are so many variables. There are so many things to control, and here is really impressive efforts to try to control it. And I'll tell you right off the bat, the stats for this paper are way above my pay grade to really comment on. Um, but I was very impressed by how many things were controlled for. What was interesting, though, was that the study authors and their messages were different, again, from the press release. And so I point out, I, this was actually supposed to have moved, but I guess I forgot to move it. This was the calorie intake in this study, also a strangely low number, looking at food frequency data. Um, this was the calories calculated for the participants of this study, far lower than the calories that we believe are being consumed by the average person. Maybe, you know, nurses and doctors are truly consuming that many fewer calories than everybody else, but I, I do worry about you know, the robustness of these sorts of studies when you get these sorts of average calorie intakes. But the press release, Red Meat Consumption Linked to Increased Risk of Total Cardiovascular and Cancer Mortality out of Harvard, um, and then the resultant news stories, Death by Bacon, Eating Red Meat is Risky, All Red Meat is Risky from the LA Times, really conflict with what the actual authors say, where the authors were very clear. The authors said that eating high amounts of red meat were risky. Not any amount, but high amounts very specifically. And, you know, the, which was Frank Hu said, a moderate consumption, for example, one serving every other day, I think is fine to the LA Times. In that same article that said eating anything is unhealthy. And we do know that not everybody reads the articles. In fact, most people don't read the articles. They read the headlines. And then Ann Penn, uh, one of the co-authors, also said that he himself eats uh, two servings of red meat a week. And then if you crunch the data, the numbers from the study itself, what this translated to was that eating red meat every day 
increase the annual risk of death by 0.16 percent per year, or 1.6 additional deaths per 10,000, or sorry, per 1,000 per person years. Um, and then when you consider that very small number in the context of what I feel to be confusing calorie data that might suggest that maybe food frequency questionnaires aren't as useful as we wish they were, uh, I do wonder about whether we can make these sorts of conclusions. And I guess I wonder too whether or not this sort of thing is contributing to societal confusion and helping sell foods that masquerade themselves as being healthful. You know, so this is Belveda breakfast cookies. I call them cookies because they truly have pretty much the same composition as Oreos, but with some fiber as well. Um, I think that the public is really confused because it seems like every week there is a new study that is a conflicting study that says this nutrient is good, this specific food is good, this nutrient is bad, and this era of nutritionism where we are pointing our fingers at single food items I think is making us miss forests for trees. This is Minute Maid that has DHA included. If you drink eight liters of this, you will get as much DHA as having a single serving of salmon and along with it you'll get a pound of calories and five cups of sugar. This is also DHA. This is a yogurt that's marketed to children well, to parents, I suppose, the kids aren't buying it, that is specifically stating that having yogurt with DHA will make your kids uh, smarter and brain development will improve and so on and so forth. When you look at the label for this particular product, it actually says zero milligrams of DHA. And the reason it says zero is because it has such a small amount that they aren't legally allowed to report that it's there, but when you call them on the phone, which I did, to ask why does it say zero if it's not actually there, um, they said, well, it's too small a number for us to be allowed to put it on the Nutrition Facts panel. If your child eats a piece of salmon that has one-third the volume of a pea, they get as much DHA as is in this particular product. Um, this one, Wonder Bread, similar idea. Again, DHA is something that people really like to put in food and then charge you more for it. 214 slices of this bread will provide your child with a single serving worth of DHA that they would get in actual fish. And, of course, you can get whole grains in Tostitos because who wouldn't want to get their whole grains from Tostitos? I know I would. They're much more delicious than uh, bulgur sometimes. And uh, you can get Kraft Dinner that is now smart to eat because they put ground up oat hulls in it for fiber. Now, never you mind that studies on fiber aren't on ground up oat hulls, but rather on dietary patterns as a whole. Because we talk about fiber as being helpful, we can sell this at a higher cost. There's actually smaller amounts of Kraft Dinner in this box than in regular Kraft Dinner. And of course, it costs more money. And then here's chocolate Cheerios that has, when compared with Fruit Loops, it has identical amounts of sugar, 17% more calories, 40% more sodium, and 11% less fiber, actually, of Fruit Loops. But again, because we have a society that, A, allows these sorts of messages on boxes, and B, I think, a society that is incredibly confused by huge amounts of data coming out that is often conflicting, I think we have problems. I mean, I think eating patterns are something we know a lot more about and getting people to eat more actual food from fresh whole ingredient food would go a very long way. You know, we know there are patterns of dietary consumption that are protective against various chronic diseases, but when we drill it down into single items or nutrients, I worry about confusing the public. And I don't know how to fix this because the issue isn't that the research shouldn't be done. Of course we should do research. I had to label the talk controversially because I don't think people would expect me to give a talk that didn't have at least a controversial title. Um, but, you know, I, I think that when it comes to things like press releases from institutions or from journals, uh, when it comes to peer review, when it comes to the quotes that researchers are giving the media, I think there is a lot that we could do better. I know David Allison uh, last week or two weeks ago was suggesting that there should be a peer review process for press releases. And I don't know what the solution is. Maybe Dr. Mosaferian has some, some thinking in that respect. But I do think that we can't only blame 
folks like the food industry, we can't only blame folks like media that are not reporting things well. I think we have to look at ourselves and, you know, we are far more likely to be able to rein in our own PR departments, whether they're institutional or journal-based, than we are to rein in reporters who their job is to sensationalize things. And I realize it's probably the job of uh, PR teams and institutions to do that too, but somehow I think we should have more sway over them and I wonder if that isn't something we should be paying more attention to. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yoni. Unfortunately, due to time, we just have time for two very clippy questions. If, if, if you have uh, that opportunity um, uh, to uh, then give time to our guest from out of country, uh, who Laurie will then introduce. So uh, perhaps we have a, a, um, a first question right here. Uh, Bill Graber, just a quick uh, qu uh, Basically, you, you know, the emperor has no clothes. You've said it again. And uh, you know, the scientists who do this get I mean, they, they have to do it. They get paid to do this. They get funding research. But uh, as far as institutional controls, uh, I, I guess I don't have a question. Just, there's more of a comment that I, it's hard to see because we're all sort of in the same bathwater as, as Coca-Cola, unfortunately. But it would be ideal to, to – so anyway, thank you. Okay. Hi, Thank Catherine you. Morrison from McMaster. Um, this, this is a question that relates to your last comment, actually. Um, certainly as a researcher, I'm, I'm not trained as a media person, uh, and uh, I find it very challenging, in fact, to speak to the press and hope that my message is coming across as I would like it to. And so my question is, are you aware of how many uh, research institutions or academic institutions in Canada actually have training programs for their researchers uh, in, in that vein, because I think it's very important. It's uh, also a really easy question, because the answer for me is I don't know, but Alex, do you know you were raising your hand? No, we do. I, I mean, she would have. So I, I imagine there are some, uh, uh, but I imagine it is the minority and that not everybody would go through with those sorts of teachings, because for you to go on your own time to seek this out and to ask to do it, I think would be a rarity and kudos to you if it's something you want to do. But I bet you most people don't even think about doing it and are excited to be able simply to speak to the press and in some cases may well want to pump up their studies because it's fun to talk to the press. Second question being for those who do have them, Gio, uh, have you evaluated the effectiveness? Now I'm above my pay grade. Uh, so uh, I don't know the answer to that question. I know our, our communications department uh, um, has a strategy around uh, areas of greatest interest from the public perspective uh, and doing media training to equip our researchers and physicians to be able to do that work. I, I'll follow up a lot. It's a good question. 